All right. I think we'll get started and um, I think a few more people will probably join. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining this um, early access webinar. It's the, really the first time we host in the developer community meetup uh, one of these. And we have another one coming up on Thursday on another early access webinar, another early access program, sorry. So this one is about HP Ismail Unified Analytics. And today with me, um, we should have had uh, Shrek, but uh, there was a last minute problem and we have Matt with us today. And uh, it's great. We had Matt in the past with talking to us already. So uh, really happy to have uh, to have Matt as a, as a replacement. Um, before Matt goes on, I have just a couple of slides I'd like to share with you so you understand a little bit, bit better, maybe if you're not familiar with um, with uh, with the developer community. Um, my name is Didier and I, I'm the tech lead for, for this community. We have with me uh, Denis and also Fred uh, as an attendee uh, will, will uh, they help me with the links and uh, answering the, in the Q&A. Um, we, uh, we will ask you to put uh, the more interesting things in the Q&A as the chat. So we found a little bug which is you cannot cut and paste from the chat. So all the links and everything interesting will be put in the Q&A. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to uh, to ask them there. Uh, Matt will take uh, a look at the questions, or we'll interrupt him uh, on a regular basis to to um, to give answers. So let me tell you a few more uh, things about uh, our developer community. Uh, we have two types of these talks. We have those meetups, and uh, they run on Wednesdays. Um, uh, monthly, uh, uh, once a month, sorry, the meetups, and they are the last Wednesday of every month. We've been running those since last year, January, um, with a pretty uh, good success, I have to say. They are more in-depth on technology. Regularly, we talk about open source things, but not always. And uh, somebody was asking, what's the next session on, uh, on, on January 19th? So that's Thursday. We have the early access webinar for HP GreenLake for Data Fabric. So uh, if you tune in at the same time on Thursday, um, and we will have this one. So. Uh, the, the webinars, the two webinars for, for the early access are not aligned on Wednesdays, as you can notice, uh, but for the rest, you'll see we go back to our regular cadence. So January 25th, we have a, a GreenLake and Infrastructure as Code. This is a, a very interesting session on uh, using um, GreenLake resources, uh, using uh, the Terraform provider for HP GreenLake. So if you're interested, uh, please join. Uh, all of these meetups are advertised on our meetup page. and. All the links to the to the replay are also put there after we gone through the process of making them available on YouTube. So somebody was asking earlier, I think it was Jeff. Uh, yes, we will record and it will be put there. Uh, let's say in one week from now, I should be um, gone through the entire process. On February, we have a, a session on Galadriel. So this is a code name for uh, Spire Federation. Um, so Spire, if you're not familiar, is a uh, is, um, uh, zero trust security <clears throat> open source project, which is now which is part of the CNCF uh, and it's highly maintained by uh, by HPE. And we have two speakers, two maintainers for, from the project talking about uh, the Galadriel. And we recently signed uh, another meetup here, which I, I think would be really interesting if you're doing any work with Postman. Uh, they have uh, asked us if they could uh, have a slot to talk about. Um, uh, their products and um, I think uh, they would like us HPE to probably go for, for an enterprise uh, license but uh, they, they're going to talk about uh, the products uh, and what you can do with Postman. I know many of us including uh, write papers and use this to explore APIs and uh, it's actually quite a nice product so uh, I think that's going to be an interesting session. We have a different kind of talks called the Munch and Learn. Um, and the mentioners are a little bit different because they're more like you would say you could say a higher level, but I would say they're more thought leadership, vendor agnostic, and they talk about, uh, for example, on February 15, we have uh, Andrew and Scott. They'll be talking about research, um, scientific research, and simulation um, using open source software. So this is driven by a team that maintains an open source project called SmartSim. But it's it's a more generic, more general discussion around scientific research in high performance computing and simulation. And finally, on March 15, uh, we have a, 
another uh, really cool session on quantum quantum computing from HP Labs. So uh, by Kirk uh, Bresnicker, and um, I think this is going to be a really cool session as well. And um, uh, so Kirk will talk about uh, what what it's uh, what's the stage what's the state of the research on quantum computing and um and this is uh march 15th so uh, again the links are on mention on the mention on page uh you can already register for this and this so uh, feel free to to join us <clears throat> so the community is also about uh trying out things uh, online and we have a, a special program called the workshops on demand uh, for that uh, and the workshops that we what we call workshops is uh and we have 29 workshops in our catalog is a Jupyter notebook based um, kind of training uh, where you can follow along and uh, the instructions in Jupyter uh, and you can run some piece of code uh, within the Jupyter notebook. So we have 29 workshop covering a vast uh, range of subjects, open source ones and, and product ones. Feel free to take a look. Uh, it's available 24 by seven over the network and it's free of charge. Give it a try and if you do provide us with feedback what's missing what you'd like to see what you didn't like what you didn't like finally um just as a last point uh, this is a community so we need you to uh, contribute and and make it work with us um, and amplify things for example if you know people that uh, might be interested by some of our talks don't hesitate to forward the links and invite them to join these are open uh, talks so uh, anybody can join um students customers, partners. If you feel there is a, an interest there, uh, don't hesitate and um, to have them join us. We have a monthly newsletter, which is the best way to keep track of uh, replay availability. What's our next talk? What's our newest blog? Uh, feel free to sign up yourself and to get others to, uh, to join. Um, we have a Slack. So of course we have a channel in the HPE internal Slack, but we have a dedicated external Slack with a channel for each of the products and open source technology we we are covering and uh, you can uh, we have customers asking questions there so it's quite an active slack uh, don't hesitate to join and select the channels that you're interested in again uh, the links will be uh, provided in the in the chat and in the q a sorry <clears throat> we have a twitter account you can follow called hp underscore developer if you are a subject matter expert, you'd like to contribute and um, you can do that by writing a blog. We have a, an open source uh, CMS that you can easily, it's based on GitHub and Markdown. So it's nothing really uh, rocket science here. And um, you can write pretty easily a blog and submit it to us through a pull request and we'll go into a review with the team and uh, you should be live within a week or so. You can also deliver meetups if you are a super subject matter expert again, so don't hesitate to reach out to us. And of course, you can also help with workshops on demand if you feel there's a missing thing and you'd like to help us create one, uh, it's always possible, reach out to us. So that's it, developer.hp.com is the place to start with. Otherwise, all these links are available if you scan this code uh, and uh, with your phone. And with that, I would like to hand it over to Matt for the real content of that session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Didier. Appreciate it. Good morning to all and good afternoon to some others. Uh, let me share here, share desktop. And there we go. So we're going to talk about HP Esmeral Unified Analytics. Uh, as Didier mentioned, uh, I've talked a little bit about uh, some of the products in the past, uh, whether they be uh, Esmeral Runtime's container platform uh, or the Data Fabric platform in the past. Um, Unfortunately, Street couldn't make it, but uh, I'm going to step in and kind of walk through some of these things. So give a little background of what Esmeral Unified Analytics is, uh, what we want it to become, and how we're going to be developing over time. There's going to be demoing the beta pro product that we have right now coming up for its next release, uh, general release here later this spring. Um, <clears throat> and with that, uh, please ask questions away and we'll be as, inter as interactive as we possibly can. So. Uh, Quick agenda here is the modern data paradox, the modern data stack, uh, analytics overview and the demo and how to get access to our beta program or the early access program that, that we have running at right now uh, for your customers and for any interested parties that are, that are wanting to get their hands on with the uh, unified analytics platform. Uh, 
So part of the challenges that we see uh, with the enterprise today is, is the data uh, paradox. For me, it's a, it's a little bit more real. I came from the relational database engine world. I, I did a lot of work within uh, Oracle community, within SQL Server, within DB2, and building out the information factory. Some of you may be aware of the Inman uh, data information warehouse or the Kimball adjustment of that. And we're really starting to see some of those, those pieces and parts play out over time here as we look away from data centricity to really kind of focusing on data gravity and being able to get insights from this information and some of those challenges that are there. But we also need to be able to evolve and grab a hold of cloud native applications and be much more dynamic from a cloud extensibility and expansion capability, but still have access to some of that data that's massively sitting in our data centers or throughout our data centers in a particular place, as we know data has uh, gravity in that piece of it. And so we see hybrid becoming this development platform of, of a norm of a new normal that's coming forward. And it helps us manage a little bit of what's going on with the skill set scarcity that you can find out there. Who knows Jupyter? Who knows Python? Who knows SQL? Who knows, you know, Go or any of the other languages that are out there are still kind of popular for visualizations or superset that we're using as part of our platform and really be able to kind of be dynamic in that space and, and really address what those needs are, right? Faster insights, better business outcomes. Uh, more information as far as what's going on and how to be able to make decisions with what I need to do. How am I managing my supply chain? How am I managing my customer experience? How am I de developing my products for uh, new integrations uh, that's there? And so we've built this platform to kind of enable some of that structure, especially when we start looking at what's happening in the world of open source and, and, and the developments and that happen in that space and what's happening in terms of the rapid uh, expansion of those technologies and those skill sets. What we see in the open source community, especially around Kubernetes uh, and the Hadoop space that, that came before it in Spark is that there is a lot of opportunity for uh, cutting edge technology to make it into the data center. With that comes with a great deal of risk that comes with it, right? Who's got the skill sets, as we mentioned before, the skill set structure that's, that's challenging for that piece of it, but then also the risk of I downloaded Spark 2.0 you know, uh, and I need to be able to run GPU. So now I need to go to Spark 3. I've created a new application, but it was written in, in Python 2.7, but the new platform only supports 3.2. And, and be able to do all those updates. You've updated the latest version of Jupyter Lab or Zeppelin for your notebook structure and being able to keep all those pieces and parts together. But then the security risk that goes with it, where are you getting your patches from? Who is making sure that it actually fits in there? Are you risking your you know, sensitive data to uh, nefarious sources because you didn't check those things. And one of the things we wanted to address with that is to make it easy to consume cutting edge technology without providing some sort of IP lock into that piece of it. So what we're doing with our, our platform, you'll see this with, uh, when we go into the demo, is we're gonna give you a curated set of applications that are tested, go into a common security model and give you access to be able to, to contact data and do processing wherever your data is, whether it be in the cloud, whether it be in the core data center or at an edge location, and allow you to have the flexibility to attach to a variety of different data sources, do the analysis work that's part of that, and then come up with that consumption, be able to turn it into reports for operational analytics or dashboards and other visualizations that you may need. And we do that through the Esmeral platform. Our big focus, of course, is obviously the business analyst through the machine learning engineer and being able to provide those sources to that. Unified analytics, managed open source frameworks to be able to go and hit those heavy hitting applications that drive those uh, synergies across the, that field and be able to go through that. And of course, our underpinning, if you remember from DDA's opening statements, we have a data fabric session coming up on January 19th, highly recommended because we use data fabric to make Unified Analytics, uh, the flexible resource that it uh, that it is to give that ability to do processing where your data is and to release some of that pressure from data gravity that happens. So without further ado, I'm going to run right into the, uh, to, the to the demos. My earpods uh, try to uh, escape here for a minute. So if you log in to our 
Unified Analytics homepage, you're going to get hit with a dashboard. And it's going to tell you some basic information that's there. Now, the idea and the scope of Unified Analytics is that hybrid deployment model. It can be run in a cloud environment. It can be run on bare metal in your data centers uh, or in your, in your environments that are there. It can have that scale of being able to run anywhere that you need it to go. Uh, our initial focus is going to be on as a service. We want people to be able to use this and consume it as necessary. In fact, we can give you that information on your on your dashboard. You can see what your billing rate is uh, per your environment, whether it be Azure, whether it be uh, GreenLake, whether it being uh, AWS or Google Cloud Platform. Uh, there's some other data that's on here that's useful, but we'll get back to that in just a moment. <clears throat> so you come into your data platform and what do we actually really do? Well, this is what we're providing. These application frameworks, or as I like to refer to it, uh, personas, right? Data engineers, which typically they're gonna to want to look at how are they gonna get their pipelines created? Uh, maybe they're familiar with Uzi, maybe they're already using something like Airflow today. They're gonna to bring in their, their batch ingestion from a variety of different data sources, no limits on, on where that source data comes from, be able to automate that structure that's there, be able to use tools like Superset, to visualize that data, to aggregate that data into a meaningful set of, uh, of uh, graphs and charts and other uh, consumable uh, aids that are there for that piece of it. And then my favorite, Easy SQL, the ability to go in and link to a variety of different data sources, pull them in and use a common language like SQL to be able to query that structure. And then you have great expectation, which will be managing, monitoring uh, data drift and data expectations as part of it. The data analyst, typically Spark and, and Livy, are the functions that are here today and uh, be able to go and dynamically run uh, interactive Spark sessions and to be able to take anybody's YAML file and upload it uh, and run any other Spark application that's that's part of your structure that's there. And of course, the data scientist, the ability to use Kubeflow uh, to be able to go and build uh, complex Jupyter notebooks, uh, or as an example, or MLflow from machine learning and be able to run these types of functions uh, with inside this common framework and all use the same sets of tools. I didn't have to go and log a different application, start a different environment. I just simply logged into Unified Analytics and I have all these tools available to me. Uh, so for data engineering, you can have your defined data sources that you already know about. Uh, here we have Snowflake, here we have a uh, MySQL database, uh, a couple of different uh, MySQL uh, opportunities here. We have a Microsoft SQL Server, but you know what I'm missing? I'm missing that Postgres database. Let's go and add that, or my Salesforce data, right? Everybody's got their CRM data in Salesforce, but tracking all the customer experience pieces of it, I can go and create a connection to a Salesforce entity that's there, that's shared with me, or a Postgres engine, wherever it may be. Maybe it's Redshift or something of that nature. Teradata, and again, Oracle here for that part of it. And once I have those data sources that are added, <clears throat> I can then go into my uh, data catalog and start looking at what's there. Okay, so show me the Snowflake data. Here's my call center information. Okay, so then I see what my column structure is, what the size is, what the type of data it is, but what does the data actually even look like? Is it, does it need a lot of uh, processing and spark to be able to get rid of the data? Do I need to do a lot of munging of the data in that process? I can actually start looking at some of the data that's physically in that table, what it looks like, I can add it, I can select it into this piece of it. Uh, and then I can close, and then I can go into my query editor and start looking at my data. Here's my call source data. And start creating a select data set. Select CC call center. Okay. Public dot uh, call underscore center. And then I can execute that query structure. When I start pulling those pieces in, I can start caching those, those data sets that are there. Uh, I can start building in data. Airflows to be able to go out and read these. We have a couple right now that go out and read uh, CSV files and write them into Parquet far, uh, formats for us or already ahead of time uh, to give us that flexibility in the piece of it. I can go into analytics and run my Spark analyte, uh, applications. Again, here I can go and create one. I can upload a YAML file. I can create one on the fly. I can configure my Spark application. Uh, it would be a uh, Java, Scala, Python, R, all the common things that you're familiar with. Your shared directory structure. We'll get to that in just a minute. One of the few things that are there, right? Cool things that are part of that is here's this S3 opportunity to go through that. And I'll explain that in just a moment. Cancel the wizard. 
The other part of analytics, uh, obviously, is the ability to run an interactive session. What's going on in my environment? How many things are there, that are running today? How do I do more with it uh, and expand that capability? BI reporting is for our dashboard structures. This is where we're running superset. Uh, as, as any live demo goes, right? <laughs> we've got a server 500 area that's part of it. Uh, that's good. I love doing live de demos. They're the best. <laughs> Data science pipe flows. I've already got a couple of tabs already up and running, but you can go through and look at your notebook functionality uh, with inside Kubeflow. Uh, the centralized database structure, you can see what model servers are running in the, in the environment. You can go and look at your ML flow environment structure. Uh, you have a lot of capabilities all within a common user interface so that regardless of whatever that, that team persona is, the data engineer, the data analyst, an analyst, the data scientist, they can all work collaboratively from the same frameworks and look at the same data sets and share that with inside that space. And that's all made possible through data administration of data fabrics. So today we have the one demo data fabric cluster that's here. And you can go through and look at all the various projects that are in this space. Uh, if some of you had uh, witnessed the demo that we did as part of Discover Frankfurt, um, we did a smart diagnostic application where you can go in and look at a variety of uh, uh, X-rays, scan them in real time, make determinations of, uh, of their diagnosis based upon 16 different models that were already entered in and, and, and brought together as part of that, that piece of it, though. That's all possible because we're using uh, the common structure of, of, a, of this environment, being able to pull in disparate data from a variety of different sources, a variety of different regional hospitals or uh, international hospital data sources that are there, uh, and be able to go and look at that, that piece of it. So, the other thing that's really powerful about this is adding another fabric. Uh, today for the beta, it is physically set up for, for data fabric, but as we get ready to go to production, you'll be able to add in that S3 data source, uh, whatever it may be, or potentially uh, Azure blobs later on down the road. But here's all the information I need to go and add in and extend my data universe and be able to process that information. So I need the name of the fabric, the host that it resides on, and the server ticket from the data fabric perspective to be able to access it. Add it, and it's a, a simple process of doing it. So how is some of this stuff actually run and, and being able to, to, uh, to execute? So here's Jupyter Notebook, for example. When I log into Jupyter Notebook, I've got this user space. It's part of that data fabric that's already on there. Here's our uh, Jupyter Notebook that runs the um, smart diagnostic application that we showed at uh, Discover Frankfurt, and then here's another one for financial time series. You get the relations built in as part of that process. For those that are familiar with uh, uh, the different things that we've done in the past on it, uh, here's wind turbine. One of my favorite ones here, we would go through and show the various capabilities in that part of it. So it really opens up that flexibility of sharing data across multiple data sources that are available to you, sharing across multiple skill sets and capabilities, whether it be analysts, engineers, or scientists, and be able to work in a much more collaborative uh, framework that's there. But one of the things that we do for that is we take, we talked about open source, we talked about a little bit about Kubernetes. Nowhere does a customer here have to worry about, well, I need to build a cluster. I need to work out the security model. I need to work out the uh, the sharing and the structure to be able to go out actually and, and, and share information between two different uh, healthcare uh, service providers of that nature. That information is all extra abstracted away and it's already done that as part of the normal sets of applications. For example, we talked about Snowflake. You're gonna get access to Snowflake because you've requested and you have it and you'll present it and you'll log in with that, that source as a connection uh, piece of it. The same thing happens here on the back end side. We run Kubeflow, we run uh, a lot of these things all through uh, Kubernetes, but we do it in a way that customer doesn't have to worry about that. We take care of the security structure and the pieces and parts that are running in the background. But for those that uh, may be interested in that piece of it, you can actually go and look at uh, another dashboard that we have off the side over here. We use single sign on a lot. <clears throat> I should have pre-staged the Grafana build, so I apologize for that. Um, yeah. I don't remember what 
workflows now. We can go in through and see what the actual uh, structure is of running of, of the different Kubernetes nodes and what the loads are with inside that environment. And again, the ability to share and, and go through and look at that, that data sets as, as we see them and be able to add in additional data sets and go and look at a variety of structure that's there. Um, so let's see, do we have some questions? We got four questions. Yeah, we do have a few. Uh, if you want, you, do you have access to the Q and A? I do. I've got it pulled up here. Um, so, um, Gerhard asked, "Say the software can be installed in the cloud. Does this mean that the software will be offered as a real service by various cloud providers, or will the software be installed on a server resource in the cloud?" It's a great question. I don't know the actual uh, consumption model that we're having uh, Shriek be able uh, to be on hand to answer. That would be good for it. the The idea is that, um, and the way it works right now is that within about 10 to 15 minutes, you can be up and running with a configuration to be able to support unified analytics. I don't know to the answer to that question. I don't know that if we're going to offer it as part of like the AWS marketplace and you'll see us out there and you'll grab unified analytics, or you'll still just come by us, uh, buy it from us and then go and secure your own EC2 instances, for example, and, and run it. Today, when we're doing our uh, own internal demos and we're using AWS uh, as an example, uh, we go out and request our EC2 instance and, and load it on there. So the actual consumption model, whether or not we include it on those marketplaces for those specific vendors, I don't have that answer, but I can go back to uh, uh, Shriek and company and ask for that specifically. Uh, Peter, is it possible to use Jupyter Notebooks with data access, early access? Absolutely. Yeah, no, this, this, this is actually, uh, even though it says the dev environment, uh, the early access is, doesn't, is, is this URL minus the, um, minus the dev uh, portion of it. So uh, follow the link at the end of it, the QR code uh, that's been set up, register for early access, and you can uh, go in and log in and uh, do all of these functions that are there. Uh, I believe that they still have it in there as well. So you can actually request a data fabric as well. So you can go and create a small uh, volume and inside data fabric, get the endpoints, add it in, have your own little workspace as part of that structure. Yes, you can build and schedule data pipelines. This is all fully functional software. Um, the only limitation that you'll run into is you're not going to go out and build, you know, hundreds of terabytes of structures, um, obviously, and be able to consume massive amounts of data uh, that are there. One of the things that I, I know that in this dev environments, for, for example, um, let me go, here's my dashboard. Um, uh, New notebook server. So let's say uh, one of the one of the functions that you'll have as part of Jupyter um, in this process is uh, go out and use either the default image that comes with it. So in the you'll see that you have the uh, PyTorch, you have TensorFlow, you have it with and without CUDA enabled in there. Um, you will be able to select. I don't know that it's in the early access either, so I'll find out for you for sure. Uh, but you'll have the opportunity to select and build in GPU functionality, both uh, within, well, let's select one, and then you'll have uh, the option, as we support them, the option to either go with NVIDIA or AMD uh, GPU is what will be available in early access. I don't have the final details on that. It may not have GPU support for, for testing, uh, but the functionality is being built in as we go. So you'll have that. Yes, Spark is running on Kubernetes. So part of the Spark and the Libby function is that when you go in, uh, into Jupyter, for example, and uh, request a Spark job, it'll fire off a Libby request if you've created your, your notebook that, such a, that way, it'll go and create those cells um, and be able to operate for you. Go back. So here it shouldn't have asked me for a login. It should have just asked me for a single sign-on. So um, doing Q&A, let's just do a refresh and see what happens with it. Grafana build. Uh, and yes, uh, non absentee. And you asked, do we have the ability to deploy 2x and 3x? You'll have the opportunity to bring in 2x, but all this is based on 3.2 uh, right now. See, it's not asking me for my uh, single sign on. So I'll have to fix that as part of the demo here going forward. Um, and do you have the ability to connect to a, a Spark running on an EDF? 
instant standalone. So this is a unified analytics. So everything is going to be uh, contained with inside that piece, that space of it. So let's say you're running Spark on uh, Enterprise Data Fabric and you have that share out there, those uh, those tables, those uh, data frames that are out there, you can give access to the session that you're running over here and pull in that data for sure, absolutely. But you wouldn't necessarily run into that particular Spark session, just the uh, the tables themselves that are stored on that uh, on that file share or object storage. So it can be either S3 or, um, or files. Um, that's a good question as far as the security structure. I know that it is uh, LDAP, uh, Ranger or supported um, Active Directory supported on the back end side of it. Um, so we'll go through that as well. Um, I can come back to that as, as, as a follow up on that piece of it, Nico. Yeah, there is there's a, quite a bit of logging in externally um, to, the, to, the, to the UI interface that so you can see that from an administrative perspective. Um, I don't think we go into a lot of detail inside here. Uh, you can go to the easy cluster managing. So we don't see it on this piece of it for my demo structure, but we'll provide that as a follow-up. If a new data source has been configured, Gerhard, uh, is the access to the data source then automatically configured to see the other tools? It is configured to your session. So if you go and configure that 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 part of it, then yeah, you'll be able to go in and access through uh, through the through the unified platform that's here. So uh, your Spark systems that are were there. Um, uh, one of the things that I will be doing, and it, and it may not make it into the uh, early access function, but I'll do a video as, as part of that that piece of it is uh, I'll be taking things like the wind tunnel turbine uh, Jupyter notebook. So for for example, um, this kind of goes back to the Spark questions before. In the previous world of uh, runtime analytics where this was initially built, we needed to go and configure that Spark uh, 3 environment and be able to set up the Livy environment to go out there and, or, or use a specific version of Spark 247 in this case. So we had to go in and run this uh, past the default, if you remember, because you come up and you load it into Python 3. So you need to go in and, and change the, uh, the versioning structure that's there. And then uh, the data sources themselves, I no longer need to use DataTap as fun as that was in, in, inside of uh, um, Esmeralda's runtime environment, I'm now going to end up pointing it to the local data sources that are that are that are configured as part of this process. So um, watch for that video coming up. That'll be one of the ones that I'll be doing as part of the structure, as well as adding in some additional uh, demo structures going in and bringing applications into and deploying them as part of the unified analytics. Uh, Easy SQL is part of unified analytics. Uh, so if you remember the Presto DB uh, acquisition that we made, uh, that is the enabling tool structure is Easy C as Esmeralda SQL. Um, and that is uh, what is behind uh, the status versus function capability and be able to go and run it. Um, so like if you go here and open Easy SQL, this is where it takes you. We don't really want it to be, Stefan, um, I wouldn't say we want it to necessarily be transparent. We want it to be abstracted so that they don't necessarily care whether it's on-prem or a cloud environment. Um, we wanted you to go in and we want you to go into uh, No, this data fabric is not in K8. This data fabric is, is actually running as a data fabric as a service uh, on, uh, on GreenLink as part of this uh, demo setup that's in here. Uh, there is some provisions for some pieces and parts uh, to be done as part of K8s, but it's really designed to be just that source structure of you going to run uh, data fabric as a service or data fabric as a, as a primary node. Uh, but back to the, in the initial question for Stephen, um, it'll be transparent in the sense that you go into the data services uh, configuration and add in those additional data fabrics wherever they may they may reside, right? So you can go into this list and you would see your you know data source one, data source two, data source three, four, five. So they would see that portion of it. But from a data analyst or data engineer perspective, I'm going to go in here and, and look at my data sources, and I'm going to say, okay, I've got my source system coming in, I've got my airflow working on that piece of it, but now I need to bring in some Snowflake data or I need to bring in some Oracle data. And you'll add those in here as part of that process. So we really want them to not necessarily have to think about access to those specific uh, locations, but bring in those uh, capabilities and be able to use them. 
Uh, it doesn't have any cluster uh, configurations. The uh, the intent will be t-shirt sizes, so you'll have small, medium, large uh, type structure. So regardless of whether it's Green Lake or uh, Azure or um, AWS uh, EC2 instances, you'll size it based upon that. Any other questions? No open questions. We're all answered. 17. So uh, I know it was pretty fast as part of the, the demo goes. I'd like to show the uh, the smart diagnostic application, but I didn't have a chance to uh, to bring that online and, and show that off. But it's a nice example if you guys get a chance to if you get a chance to uh, to view the video from Dis Discover Frankfurt. Uh, it's a great way of showing you have regional hospitals as an example running an, uh, an interference model uh, based upon those 16 uh, diagnosis and being able to scan images real time and and get a temporary uh, not temporary, but a, a uh, AI derived uh, diagnostic on that. Does this person have COVID? Does this person have lung cancer? Does this person have eczema? And then the knowledge sources that are there, the actual radiologists, the actual doctors can go in and edit that information uh, real time and clarify what is or what is not a particular diagnostic. And then that information is actually fed back into the centralized model. The model is updated, pushed back out and updated through the data fabric again. Uh, and then those inferences engines end up picking up that new data. And it's a nice way of showing what, what's possible and be able to be how you would be able to take something like this and use it in any of the different industries that we're after. Uh, in the demo, no, I mean, there'll be some some flexibility that that's that's part of that uh, for the Spark choices. But if you go into analytics, Spark applications, when you go to create your application, um, So you can choose scale of Python and R as part of the down, downstream structure uh, user directory. Move my QA session out of the way. So now let me add one of those files in there. Uh, but you're going to go through the dependencies and then your driver configuration and then your directory configuration. But I, it's not going to prevent me, allow me to get through there without answering all these questions. So I'll answer that one offline for you uh, as part of that goes, uh, Valerie. Ample, yes, previously, uh, Ample is now easy SQL. That is correct. Demo clusters for partners. So anybody that registers for the early access uh, will have access to the uh, to this environment. So uh, well, so the market store, the marketplace is a variety of different apps like Data IQ and all those pieces of it. This is a curated set of a specific set of applications. So right now, today, um, these are the primary applications that we offer. So Easy SQL, Superset, Airflow, uh, Spark. Livy, uh, Kubeflow, MLflow, and by by uh, association, Kubeflow being there, that is also Jupyter Notebooks. And then you can go out and create a notebook uh, with inside the structure. You can use an existing one that's there, or you can create your own. You have, uh, as I mentioned before, the opportunity to configure this in a variety of different sizes. Somebody asked you the size of the environment that you may need. Um, so when you're looking at this, um, environment, you're going to have the opportunity to look at your CPU size that you would request, the, the amount of memory that you would request, and again, the GPU structure that's there. And then we didn't really talk about this structure, but uh, you would size out your uh, new volume that was there, or if you knew that you had an existing volume, you could uh, attach to an existing volume, knowing that it was shared in a particular area, it's given a name. Uh, and then your configuration structure is an external data fabric volume, Kubeflow pipelines, cube configure the cube config secret structure that's all there. Uh, and then any type of affiliations that are there as part of that process. So here's a variety of different uh, 
volumes that have already been created as part of our uh, launch into early access. And then you have the, the quick tab at the top to get back into the primary structures that are up here floating around. And, there we, and that's what we have. Unless there's more questions. Um, so the, as a service function, um, it is going to be run through, you know, essentially GreenLake capabilities as part of those sets of SKUs. So if you're not doing it through an AWS Azure, Google, or GreenLake, then the other option would be as bare metal. Um, in terms of Gerard, you might want to you might want to send this to me directly as a, as a separate, separate thing. So other than um, the tools that are there, so uh, Python, you support pandas or an uh, Spark. It's data frames to be able to access that set of set, set of information. The other data types that you might have would be unstructured data in your object store uh, that that's out there. Um, so you'll be able to access it through through those functions as well. Um, Easy SQL just tends to be one of the more common. I shouldn't say Easy SQL SQL tends to be one of the more common languages to go and query a variety of different data sets, whether they be CSV files that you're converting into data frames or uh, actual tables and table structures. So you can actually have any of those data sources that are there as part of that structure that's there. Uh, yes, drum access would be denied. You need to register as part of the link. There was a QR code at the end of Didier's presentation and there'll be a follow up here at the end that you'll need to go and register for uh, early access. Okay, with that, I will stop sharing. Sorry, on mute, of course. Uh, lots of questions which you answered uh, live. Uh, I don't have any other questions. I will uh, launch the poll for end of session. If you have any other questions, just feel free to continue to add in the Q&A. We will make this uh, available as a replay. We will also make the PDF of the slides available. If you need uh, the slides, you can always ask Matt directly. Um, so hold on for the poll. Just three simple questions to uh, get feedback from you. The link to the early access is also in the chat. I think this was discussed earlier. We have another question from Valérie. That mute button hides as soon as you uh, close off the screen, doesn't it? So Valérie, uh, you would want to bring those containerized applications um, to unified analytics if there are an analytics type application as an example this actually came up as a question from our customer um, when i was actually out of frankfurt uh, back in december uh, unified analytics is the platform for developing new uh, data frameworks data applications for analysis machine learning and ai if those applications are what's coming in then yes you probably be able to bring them in um, if you're trying to use or develop specific things for Kubernetes, you would want to look at either con uh, containers as a service or the enterprise, uh, the Esmeral runtime uh, application. <laughs> Morris, M-O-R-R-I-S, on Slack, uh, in uh, HPE, uh, email, and on Teams. All right. No more questions for Matt. Thanks, Jeff. Feel free to join on um, Thursday for <clears throat> the second early access um, webinar on um, HP Green Lake for Data Fabric. Feel free to click on the end of session poll to give us feedback. That's also helpful.
All right. No more questions. Any closing comments, uh, Matt, from you or anything else you want to add? Just that uh, if you get a chance to try out the early access program, get registered, get logged in. Um, I've already provided some of my feedback uh, to, to the team. I, I think it's great that we have a data uh, engineering piece with Green uh, with, with the Green Lake Data Fabric. I don't like that it's down there in a wheel down at the bottom. I think that's probably one of the other aspects that the uh, individual asked about the transparency. I want to be able to more interactively act with the data sources that are there, including the files and volumes. So please get on, try it out. Um, all, all suggestions are good suggestions. Not everything will make it in. So yeah, please, please help us make the best product that to represent HPE going into this uh, in, in this environment as possible. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining this session. We we'll give you a few minutes back. Uh, thank you for answering the poll. Uh, we'll talk to you Thursday for the next early access or next week for the next meetup. Thank you very much. Bye bye.